Let's sing together. How many of you are glad that Jesus is your Savior? Yeah, right? Isn't that great? Is there anything you can do to undo what he did on the cross? I may not have been clear. Can you take Jesus off the cross? Nope. You can't do it. That's why we sing this song, Blessed Assurance. It's a great blessing to know the assurance we have in Christ. That's what it's about. Sing together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine.
steal our hearts. You're the only one, and we praise you for it. You're the only one with the assurance that we that it's genuinely blessed, it comes from you, that we can stand here tonight and know that salvation is secure. If we trust in you as our Lord and Savior, thank you, Lord, for that assurance. In your name we pray, amen, amen. You may be seated.
Friends, standing alone before the world, I mean, think about this. How did Martin Luther come to such heroics, risking his life for the sake of God's truth? How did he do it? Conviction. Conviction. That's how he was able to do it. He knew that it was God's will for him to go there to worms and to declare the truth to the world regardless of the consequences, regardless of what he was going to face. Hey, even when his friend begged him not to go, he still went. You see, Martin Luther had the conviction of doing what God told him to do over what man asked him not to do. Let that sink in. Friends, that's what it takes to be bold for Christ. We have to have that conviction of choosing God over man's will. Even if it's going to cost us dearly. Even if it's going to cost us our life. And so in our passage of Scripture tonight, we see the Apostle Paul set sail to do the exact same thing that Luther did. And, and, and you know, perhaps, just perhaps, Luther was thinking about the Apostle Paul and was thinking about this and the boldness from, from Paul's example. And, and maybe he saw this. And, and so let's dive in and see Paul did the exact same thing that Luther did, or that Luther did the same thing that Paul did. Let's see this. Let's learn here from tonight, and let's see the conviction of choosing God over choosing man. Okay? Out of honor and reverence, the reading of the word for physical evil. Please stand with me. We're going to be reading the first 16 verses of here, chapter 1. <clears throat> chapter 21. Now it came to pass that when he had departed from them and said so, running a straight course, we came to Kos the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. When we had sighted Cyprus, we passed it on the left, sailed to Syria, and landed at Tyre, for there the ship was to unload her cargo. And finding the Cyprus, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem. When we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city, and we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship, and they returned home. When he had finished, uh, and when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Polemus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we, who were Paul's companions, departed and came to Caesarea, and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. And as we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt, and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we see saying, The will of the Lord be done. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to launch. Let's pray. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time you've given us. Father, may we see the importance of following through with the conviction that you've laid on our hearts, Lord. And, and even when man comes alongside us, Father, may we... May we not be, be deterred from it, Lord. No, no, no. Lord, may we continue to be faithful to fulfill your word, to do what you've asked us to do. And so, Lord, right now I pray that we learn from this example of the Apostle Paul. Lord, we just heard how, how Martin Luther, and I, I'm so thankful that, that he stood his ground. He stood for what he believed in instead of just following the orthodox faith. No, no, no. Lord, I, I pray that we understand that your word is true and that we'll stand for it no matter what. And whatever you lay on our heart, Father, I pray that you find us faithful. Father, once again, may, may we not shun away because others ask us to, but no, Father, that we follow through with your convictions that you've laid upon our heart. And so, Lord, I, I pray right now that, God, we apply what we see tonight. God, we learn from the Apostle Paul and that we are a church, we are a body of believers that are here tonight that are saying, you know what, we're, we would much rather do what you want us to do, Lord, than what man wants us to do. Father, find us faithful. And, Lord, I ask that you use this time to draw people to yourself. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. Maybe so. From this passage, <clears throat> and actually many others, we see that the Apostle Paul set the example as someone who stood up for strong convictions over the will of man. We, he, he's done this already time and time again. 
And, and you know, I think it's safe to say that bold commitment tied together with strong conviction, friends, is an unstoppable force for a great leader in the kingdom of God. It takes those two together. I, I mean, think about biblical heroes like Joshua and Caleb who had such passion and conviction, and they knew that God would give them the victory. Can you imagine how it broke their heart when the other spies said, no, we can't do it? Can you imagine how it broke their heart when Moses sided with the other men instead of them? But Moses, we've seen God do mighty things. He can give it. He's promised us this land. Folks, so all we got to do is go get it. They had that conviction because God told them so. Can you imagine how they felt afterwards? But friends, think about David's conviction. Think about David's conviction that, that he knew that God could easily whip that Philistine. Can you imagine the, the, the little teenage boy when he looked and he saw the entire army of Israel standing back in fearful mold and he was like, wait a minute, you're letting him curse the army of the living God? I'll take care of this. <laughs> Why? Because of his conviction. Not only that, for instance, think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego who were willing to give up their lives rather than to give up their conviction that God alone is to be worshipped. God can deliver us, O king, but if not, we still will not bow down to this idol of yours. <laughs> Why? Because of conviction. Because of their conviction. And church, we can go on and on and on, but, but Paul, along with them, despite the warnings from his closest friends, even Philip's four daughters that were prophets, and even another prophet, prophet of God named Agabus that, that comes along, Paul never wavered in his conviction. Because he wanted to be faithful to fulfill God's will in going on to Jerusalem. He knew what it was going to cost him. We'll get to that in just a moment. But he had conviction. So, Brother Colin, you're, you're saying we're to follow Paul's example tonight. And that's what we prayed just a little bit ago. But, but what does this conviction really look like? What does it look like that, that we can learn from Paul right here? What, what do we need to see that we can apply to our own lives? Well, first of all, friends, we see that it takes the conviction of knowing your purpose. It takes the conviction of knowing your purpose. Listen right here again in verse 1 through 3. Now it came to pass that when he departed from them and set sail, running a straight course, we came to Kos, the following day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. And finding a ship sailing over to Phoenicia, we went aboard and set sail. And when he incited Cyprus, we passed on the left, Sailed to Syria and landed at Tyre. For there, the ship was to unload her cargo. Stop right there. You're probably like, all of these places means nothing to me. Why, why are you saying this right here, Brother Colin? Well, listen. Conviction really brings about a clear purpose. You understand. You see, Paul was convinced that he had to get to Jerusalem no matter the cost. And, and listen, God had purpose for him being there at Jerusalem. We know that. We talked about that, about that before. But verse 1 right here in chapter 21 reminds us of really Paul's emotional farewell from the Ephesian leaders. As a matter of fact, here's a word that we just simply think means departed. Matter of fact, Luke uses the term departed here. But can I tell you tonight that when you do word study on this, I want you to understand it's not the term departed that we're used to. As a matter of fact, friends, we think of it, once again, as just leaving, but it's more than that. Here's where, once again, Bible study comes in. This is, this is good stuff. Luke actually uses the word apospeo, which means this, to tear away from. Write that down. Because look right here in verse 1 again. Now it came to pass that when he had torn away from them. Do you remember what happened when we just left them with the Ephesians? Do you remember they wept, they cried over him, they didn't want him to go? Here he is, and remember last week we talked about how, how difficult it is to, to, to lead people? Paul had to literally tear himself away from his sorrowing friends. Friends, listen to me. We all know that it's hard to say goodbye sometimes, especially when we know that we will never see them again on this side of glory. That's hard, man. That's hard. And they knew that they were never going to see him again. And, and they wept over it. And, and, and friends, he had to tear himself away. But the Bible says that Paul went on his journey and, and he endured a trip filled with time-consuming stops on the way to Pateras. He continued to move on forward. And from there, he booked a passage, a nonstop 400-mile voyage to the port of Tyre. Dangerous. 
Andrew lay ahead. But as we've seen week after week, he wanted to be there in time for Passover. So Brother Callan, what, why make a big point about all these little ports? Why make a point right here talking about his purpose? Why, why, why make this point here? Well, friends, I want to remind you that this is more than just a story. Do you hear me? It's history. It's history. And also, friends, this recounting of Paul's travels, it, it really portrays a man driven to fulfill the priority of the will of the Lord in his life. He was willing to go through all this. He knew what God had called him to do. And friends, no matter how many ports he was going to have to go through, he had the conviction to fulfill it. He wanted to fulfill it. Now, here's something I want to bring about. Can you imagine how tired this man had to have been? Think about that. You've probably never really thought about that before. Think about how tired he had to have been. I mean, I don't know about you, but I get tired when I go to the airport. Right? And then especially if you have a few layovers, and then you have to catch this plane, and you get to this plane, and, and we get what what's called jet lag, right? And it normally then takes us a day to get over that, right? I mean, all you're doing is sitting there flying, but it wears you out. Now, why are you saying that, Brother Colin? Well, I can't imagine sailing from port to port, getting off one ship, going to the next, going to the next, and, and with the storms they had to face and everything else. But church, listen, he had conviction of knowing his purpose, and he wanted to fulfill it. And church, listen, that's what it takes. That's what it really takes. May we have the drive and conviction of knowing our purpose. And hey, if we have to travel the world, then so be it. So be it. We have to fulfill our purpose. But secondly, friends, we see that it also takes the conviction that must overcome pressure. The conviction that must overcome pressure. Listen to verse 4 through 6 again. And finding disciples, we stayed there seven days. They told Paul through the Spirit not to go up to Jerusalem. And when we had come to the end of those days, we departed and went on our way. And they all accompanied us with wives and children till we were out of the city. And we knelt down on the shore and prayed. When we had taken our leave of one another, we boarded the ship and they returned home. Did you catch that in verse 4? Did you, did you catch what I'm saying right there? They told Paul, listen to this, through the Spirit... Not to go up to Jerusalem. Man, you know that had to be rough on Paul. You see, let me explain. You see, he was entire here for only seven days. And yet the Bible says that as he is leaving, entire families are coming out begging him to stay. They're begging him. And, and they're even using the excuse of, God has laid on our heart that you need to stay. That's what, that's what it says. Through the Spirit, they're, they're saying this. And verse 5 says that they knelt down on the beach and prayed. They loved him. And, and you know, friends, I, I'll be honest with you. I would not be surprised if some of those prayers were not a bit aggressive. What do you mean, Brother Colin? Maybe it went something like this. Lord, we thank you for bringing Paul to us. And Lord, we want him to stay a little bit longer. Lord... Let him see that he's not supposed to go, Lord. Let him see that's the case. Lord, change his heart. Let him stay with us a little while longer, Lord. Let him stay. So, church, Paul must have experienced that a confusion, really just confusion right here with, with just an emotional mix. I, I mean, think about this. So, so let me ask you this question. When, when we see that, what it says right there, they told Paul, through the Spirit, not to go up to Jerusalem, that brings up the question, did Paul sin by resisting their warnings, especially after what verse 4 says right there? No. For several reasons. And let me explain. You see, first, through the Spirit, that term right there is inclusive. What do you mean, Brother Colin? Well, it merely means that someone spoke as a spiritual gift of prophecy. Okay? Someone was speaking there about that. Second, we know that Paul lived a life that was really, friends, sensitive to the Spirit's leading. He was very sensitive. As a matter of fact, we know that there were other times when he was forbidden to go to certain areas. Paul recognized that. And he did not go. And so Paul did not disobey. So, friends, that long-term pattern of obedience makes it unlikely that he was disobedient in this manner. 
No, he wasn't being disobedient at all. Third, friends, we also know that he wasn't sinning here and went going against the Spirit because the Holy Spirit had never before prohibited Paul from going to Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, flip back to chapter 20. I want you to see something here. In chapter 20, listen to what is said in 22 and 23. And see now, listen to this. I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem. Not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. He, had, he was bound to go by the Spirit. He already knew that he was going to be bound in chains when he got there. He already knew what he was going to be facing. But the Spirit had already told him to go. So Paul was warned by the Spirit what awaited him there, but the Spirit never told him not to go. Does that make sense? And finally, friends... The very next verse, verse 24 of chapter 2, when you, when you look at this here, of chapter 20, I'm sorry, says, But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Notice what Paul said right there. Paul describes his mission to Jerusalem really as the ministry which I've received from the Lord Jesus. There it is. So the question is then, church, think about this. How could the Holy Spirit forbid Paul from doing what the Lord Jesus had commanded him to do? Church, I remind you, he never contradicts himself. God never contradicts himself. And so we know that he was compelled with conviction to fulfill the Lord's will. And church, that had to overcome pressure. He had to overcome the pressure. Let me ask you this, friends. Has the Lord ever laid something on your heart, but you let really the pressure of others get to you and stop you from doing it? Let me ask you this. Maybe, maybe they said you couldn't do it. Maybe they told you that you needed to pray about it a little bit longer. Hey, that brings up another question. Have you ever prayed yourself out of doing something that you know God had led you to do? Maybe you prayed yourself out of it. In other words, he told you what he wanted, but you talked yourself out of it. Hey, I've told you this before. Th think about how silly this sounds. When you know God has laid something on your heart, and yet we sit back and say, well, I need to pray about it a little bit more. Wait a minute. Prayer is talking with God. God has told you what he's wanted you to do. Why do you need to keep talking to him about it? Just be faithful. Just be obedient. But yet we do it, and then you know what happens? We tend to listen to self. We tend to listen to flesh when we think it's God. And because of that, we talk ourselves out of situations sometimes. Whether it's missions, whether it's giving, whatever it may be. Friends, we have to overcome that pressure. Friends, we see right here <laughs> that neither the threat of persecution nor the the pleadings of his well-meaning fellow believers could not divert Paul from fulfilling his calling. And like Paul Church, we must have the conviction to overcome the pressure. When pressure comes our way to stop us, hey, church, I want to remind you, the devil can still work through believers to stop you from doing something. You remember what Peter, what about good old Peter, right? Right? Oh, no, Lord. This should not be. I can't imagine the look that Jesus gave Peter when he said, get behind me, Satan. Think about that. He was trying to stop the plan. So, church, we, we have to have the conviction to overcome the pressure. Which then, friends, leads us to our third point, that we must have the conviction that's willing to pay the price. We must have a conviction that's willing to pay the price. The price. Listen to verse 7 through 14. He says this, back in our main text. And when we had finished our voyage from Tyre, we came to Polemus, greeted the brethren, and stayed with them one day. On the next day, we, who were Paul's companions, departed and came to Caesarea, and entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. Now this man had four virgin daughters who prophesied, and 
As we stayed many days, a certain prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. When he had come to us, he took Paul's belt, bound his own hands and feet, and said, Thus says the Holy Spirit, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Now when we heard these things, both we and, from, and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. And Paul answered, What do you mean by weeping and breaking my heart? For I'm ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. So when he would not be persuaded, we cease saying, The will of the Lord be done. Paul now comes to the port city of Jerusalem, Helenus. He comes here, and he comes to Caesarea, and he enters the house of Philip. And yes, friends, if you want to write it down the side, this is the same Philip, the one that took the gospel to Samaria and then baptized the Ethiopian eunuch. It, it is that same Philip. God had now blessed him with four daughters. And they had each been blessed with the gift of prophecy. And they prophesied about Paul's journey and his future in Jerusalem. And then the Bible says that another prophet enters in the scene, a man by the name of Agabus. And Agabus comes along and he takes Paul's belt and the Bible says that he bounds himself up, he ties himself up, prophesying that this is what's going to happen if Paul went. But I want you to notice something very interesting right here. You're talking about turning up the heat on Paul. Listen to verse 12 again. Listen to this. Now, when we heard these things, both we and those from that place pleaded with him not to go up to Jerusalem. We... Underline it. We. Who's we? Luke. The one that's writing the book. Think about that. The ones that had been by his side on this journey, writing things down. The ones that had been his faithful companions. They had been with him no matter the cost. Now they were saying, Paul, you don't need to go. Paul, think about what you're doing right here. Once again, friends, if the pressure before had not been hard enough, but now it says, we pleaded with him not to go. Wow. That'll make you think there, won't it? We. And listen to what Paul says in verse 13. Paul, Paul looks and he says, and Paul answered, what do you mean by weeping? Notice this. And breaking my heart. You know this was hard for Paul. I mean, even his close companions said, you know what? That's it. That's the line. You know, we can't go. We can't go. You know, and included with Paul, you're not going. We're not going. We're going to make sure this doesn't happen. You're not going. Paul says, what do you mean? By doing all this crime, you're breaking my heart. You know what Paul's saying there? You know I have to put God first. You know I have to do this. Why are you breaking my heart? Why are you now turning against me and what God has told me to do? You know it was hard. But I also love his answer at the end of verse 13. For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die at Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. That's the conviction that it takes, church. That's what it's all about. Hey, you know what? God has already told you. You're not telling me anything new, Agabus. Hey, daughters of Philip, you're not telling me anything new. God already told me what's going to be awaiting for me at Jerusalem. So guys, why are you trying to talk me out of this? I've already shared this with you. You know what I'm going through. Why are you weeping and, and now breaking my heart? And what are you doing? I am ready to die for Jesus. That's conviction. That's conviction. Regardless of the cost, he was going to continue on the path that God had for him. Church, what a man of God. What a man of God, and what a lesson for all of us to go by. And the Bible says that then they look, and, and they, they look right at him in verse 14, they tell him, the will of the Lord be done. In other words, friends, when you look at this, 
really what was being said right here is, I'm ready. I know I'm going to be bound. Hey, I'm, I'm probably going to die, but I'm ready. May the will of the Lord be done. Church, that's the conviction that it takes to be a true follower of Jesus. Whatever the cost. Whatever the cost. Whatever I have to do. Whatever the cost. So I ask you tonight, church, are you willing to pay the price? Are you willing to pay the price? I have a feeling in the very near future we'll see if that's the case. You know, it's easy to sit here tonight and say, yeah, I'm with Paul. I'm willing to go through it. I'm willing to pay the price. Hey, I'm sure Luke and those that were walking with him all the way to this point said, yeah, we're with you, buddy. And then they hear from the four daughters, and then they hear from Agabus, and they said, no, wait a minute, we've got to scrap the plan, Paul. Paul, you can't go. No, I am going, no matter the cost. I just said, I, I believe that very soon we will be in that situation. And like I said, it's easy to say it now, but, but when it costs us something to gather together, will you still gather together? When it costs us something, it may cost you family members. When family members look at you and call you a bigot and say that you're filled with hatred and intolerance, will you still stand for the gospel of Jesus Christ? Well, you still do what you have to do. Well, friends, if you are, and you know what's going to happen? Well, fourth and finally, we see that the conviction will be passed on to others. If you're willing to stand, friends, and prove that you're standing for him, then listen, your conviction will be passed on to others. Listen to verse 15 and 16. And after those days, we packed and went up to Jerusalem. And some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain innocent of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. You know, let me say this. Sometimes, church, all it takes is for one person to stand and then someone else to say, you know what? I'm going with you. I'm going with you. The Bible says right here that some of the disciples from Caesarea went with them. <laughs> Think about this. They've just heard about what it's going to cost them. Think about this, friends. They knew that he would be a marked man in Jerusalem. They knew that he would be facing hatred. He would be facing imprisonment. He would probably be facing even death. And being with him, friends, that would put them in the same boat. But instead, they saw this man's conviction. They heard, they heard, and they saw the changing power of the gospel. And so they said, you know what? Hey, I'm going with him, baby. Amen. That's what it takes. When you stand... Others will stand. Others will stand. His strong conviction was passed on to others, and then they had the conviction to stand for the gospel as well. In other words, listen to me, friends. Make your conviction contagious. Make it contagious. Let others see it in you, and let them catch it. Let them catch it. Church, I, I'm telling you right now, I'm not a prophet nor son of a prophet. But clearly we can see what lies ahead for the church. It's time for us to stand up for our convictions now. We don't need to wait. We stand for our convictions now. We need to stand now, may we have such strong convictions that, that we know our purpose. We will, we will overcome the pressure that may come from all sides. Of church, may we be willing to pay the price and may we pass on that conviction to others. You know, maybe tonight in closing, you want to spend some time at this altar tonight and say, Lord, I'm ready. Maybe you're not. You just want to be real and say, Lord, I'm not ready. God, I know you, I love you, but I've weighed the cost, and I don't know yet, God. God, would I be willing to do it tonight? Well, friends, maybe that's
that's something you need to spend time with the Lord with. Maybe your conviction to listen to man outweighs conviction to listen to God. Friends, maybe you're in a situation right now that I have no idea, nor no one else has an idea about what you're dealing with. But you know it's time to make a stand for the Lord. Maybe you need to come to this altar and spend time in prayer about it. But friends, I'll tell you this. You'll never be able to stand on your own about convictions if you don't have the conviction of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're here tonight, and you know, once again, hey, I look out Sunday night, Bible study. I've said this before. You're back. So this tells me I, I'm looking at those that love the Lord and want to grow in the Lord. But you know what? I don't know your heart. I don't know your heart. Maybe you're here tonight and you need to get things right for the Lord. I'd love to pray with you. This altar is open. Church, may Central Baptist Church and the believers of Central Baptist Church be known of having our convictions and standing on the truth of the Word of God. If you need to pray for boldness, this altar is open for us. Father, I thank you for the time you've given us. Father, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you that, that Paul held fast to his convictions, even, even when these families told him not to go, even when, even when these prophets told him not to go, even when those closest to him told him not to go. God, he was faithful to you above all. Father, may that be our testimony tonight as well. May we hold to the conviction that you give us, God. The conviction of your truth, your gospel. May we never waver from it. And Lord, whenever you lay something on our heart, may we be faithful to fulfill it through your strength. And so Lord, I pray for this invitation time tonight. Lord, I pray for those that need to come. Those that just need to spend time with you at this altar. Whatever it may be. Father, draw people to yourself. Let us be faithful, Lord. Let us be faithful. We love you. And I ask that you use this invitation time right now. Draw people to yourself. Magnify your kingdom right now, Lord. Empower your people. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.